Hello and good evening. Welcome to the Lessons of Vietnam from North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated. My name is Bill Dixon and my co-host, the educational czar for North Carolina Vietnam Veterans Incorporated, <laughs> Mr. Bob Matthews. Thank you, Bill. Uh, he's a retired teacher after 40 years and wrote a course called The Lessons mm -hmm. of Vietnam, which is in about 1,200 to plus schools nationwide. We even took it to Vietnam. And tonight we're very fortunate. We have a, uh, an award-winning author, uh, a blogger, uh, a genuine uh, Vietnam vet, and so forth, and here's his book. I'm going to hold it up and see if I can get it where you, with the light hits and so forth. It's called Cherries, a war, uh, Vietnam War novel. Uh, fantastic book. I'll be honest with you, I haven't finished reading it yet. When I got the book, I had three books going at the time, and, uh, but what I have read so far is fantastic. And uh, uh, Bob, you got something you want to say before we put uh, John back on? I do. I, I'd like to, first of all, thank John for coming on the show and endorse this book. It's maybe the best book on Vietnam I've ever read. It is. It, it's reads, it reads easy and just like you sit down talking to somebody. Well, you know why? It's a, it's a grunt story. It's Vietnam. <clears throat> it's Vietnam from the ground floor up. Mm -hmm. It's a book every American that lived through the 60s and the 70s and lived through the Nam years has to read. Yeah. It's wonderful. Well, you know, well, Bob, when I, when I started reading it, uh, I'm reading about uh, when he landed at Benoit Air Base and going to knife replacement. I'm going, God, he's telling my story. <laughs> That's your story. Yeah. You Benoit guys, you're all like. <laughs> yeah. And um, But before we get going uh, uh, with John, I want to make a quick commercial announcement. Uh, this Friday night uh, at the North Carolina History Museum, downtown Raleigh, the big museum down there, we're presenting... Uh, the Vietnam, the women who served, uh, it's a story of uh, four women who volunteered to go to Vietnam uh, and their, their year of tour duty, and uh, we're going to have them from uh, 8 to 9 o'clock. We're going to have Lee Wilson, who's been on the show before. She was an engineer in Vietnam. She was at Long Bend, uh, I think sometime along about the same time I was there. Yep, yep. She was the only woman on the airplane landing in Vietnam. Uh, at uh, at Benoit Air Base, and went went through. Uh, she didn't have to go to the ninth replacement. I believe she was just picked up right there and carried right over to uh, uh, Long Bend. And then Bonnie Kerr. Uh, Bonnie's been on the show before. Uh, Bonnie was uh, uh, worked in the embassy in Saigon, and she one time worked for Henry Kissinger at the State Department. Uh, Nancy Mackey was uh, with the Red Cross. We call her our favorite donut dolly. And then Judy Jones was a, a nurse. And they're going to be telling you their story. And uh, come down to the History Museum with us and join us down there to hear these four special ladies. And not to hold us up anymore, I want to introduce you to our guest tonight, uh, all the way from uh, Michigan. John, John, I'm sorry, my southern tongue didn't always do this right. John Polaski? You got it, Bill. Okay. Well, my son-in-law is also uh, uh, Polish, uh, uh, so uh, I do have a little bit of practice with it. You thank you for being with us tonight, and thank, thank you for you writing this book. It's uh, a fantastic book, and uh, give us a brief story of, uh, of uh, about you in a little bit so we know about you and, and so forth. And It's your show, so you tell us what you want to believe, and we won't know the difference. <laughs> Truly. <laughs> uh, I was born in Germany and uh, immigrated to the United States uh, when I was two years old. Uh, went to Catholic schools all my life, uh, went to college, worked full-time at one of the automotive factories, and I was failing in college, and uh, the money was nice at the factory, uh, got a new car ready to go, and I had to make a decision. So by Christmas, I uh, dropped out of college, worked six, seven days a week in the factory, and in February, I found myself in the Army. <laughs> oh, well, you you were drafted. Uh, yes. Okay. Right. Yeah, Bob was drafted. I I did dumb things. I joined the army to beat the draft, and, and <laughs> that worked out really well. Uh, the recruiter told me if I cho if I joined the army, I could choose my location. And John, you know, my ticket to Germany has been lost for the last forty seven years. I know it's in the mail. And you were a clerk, right? Uh, no, I was not a clerk. <laughs> I was a clerk, but not a clerk. Yeah. But uh, all right, so that's that's how you got to Vietnam. And uh, what year was that? 
1970. 1970. Okay. Uh, you you missed a good tet 68. That's uh, all right. I read enough about it, and I've heard enough stories about it. Uh, well, I was I was way. there. For, I was there for it. I was. Uh, uh, in fact, I I left my wife. I was married, and Bob and I were. Uh, uh, both married and our wives were, were, of course, back back here. He was from Pennsylvania and I'm from North Carolina, and our wives were back here. And I left my wife in Hawaii uh, and got back to Saigon in time for Tet to start it. Then I got back to Long Bend in time for the ammo dump to blow up. So, um, But it was a, a totally different war when you got there in the 70s because uh, I feel like that uh, the problems back home had escalated quite a bit by the time – you got there, so you probably had to worry about as much what was going on at home as you did in Vietnam to a certain extent with uh, the riots and so forth, especially being from Michigan and Detroit riots and so forth. Yeah, that was in '67. '67, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was. I remember. I was. I remember exactly where I was when Martin Luther King was assassinated, uh, and I was at Long Bend at the time. So, well, John, you know, you talked before about you got to Vietnam in August. Nice and toasty yeah. then, wasn't it? Uh, August 70. Yeah. Nice and toasty. It was kind of, yeah. kind of warm. Nice and toasty. Yeah. I think that's one thing everybody remembers when they get off of that plane. They walked out onto that uh, landing, and they got hit like opening up uh, uh, an iron-melting furnace of some sort. You know, sure. it just, boom, yeah. it hits you in the face, and... You were sweating by the time you got to the bottom of the stairs. Yeah, the smells and the heat were the one thing that all Vietnam vets uh, are, are same at. Uh, depending on what, everybody's story is different depending on what year you were there and what you did. But that plane door opening and the smells and the heat coming on, every, we've all got that same story. Or helicopter rotors. Yeah. yeah. Even today, you hear a helicopter, you stop and, and look, and that's uh, it's it's still a a uh, sound, but uh, tell what you you uh. Why, I believe you told us earlier that uh, while you were in Vietnam, you kept a diary. That's true. And uh, and you use that to uh, fall back on to to write your book. Tell me, uh, tell us briefly what made you write this book and uh, uh, to make you feel any different when you got through because you t actually got a chance to tell your story. Well, most of us didn't get a chance to tell our story. I, that's a fantastic way to. Uh, get a lot of uh, weight off of it. I just heard on the way over here, they said uh, Vietnam vets, 40% of all Vietnam vets had some minor uh, form of PTSD. And writing the sure. book has got to help a little bit. It was, it was helpful, but not so much on the PTSD side. It was uh, uh, an awareness yeah. type project. Again, uh, more to satisfy the curiosity of my wife then I, I had no intent of even writing a book. Uh, as I mentioned before, it started out several years after we had been married. Uh, my mother produced a, a shoebox and it had every letter I wrote home from Vietnam and it had my diary in there. Uh, I had just lost track of all that stuff. So we spent the afternoon sitting on the floor going through these letters in the diary and my wife kept asking, well, what's this mean? What's that mean? Because my diary was written in abbreviations most of the time. Uh, so when we got home, it was pretty much, well, could you explain this to me? And I'd write a little page. Uh, and before I knew it, I had a whole 20 pages full. And, well, why don't you just write a book? <laughs> so <laughs> I went ahead and, and uh, wrote a first-person book referring to the letters, referring to the diary. Uh, it had to be fiction because conversations that took place, God knows I could remember what I talked about last week, you know, regardless <laughs> of, of that long ago. Well, this was back in 1980. And uh, at that time, I had an electric typewriter and everything was typed with carbon paper. So wow. uh, with my rewrites and everything else, unlike a computer today, when I had to add a word or, or change a sentence, I had to retype the whole chapter, not just one page or add a couple words. Uh, Atari came out with a computer in 1985, and I was able to uh, write the whole book in the first person, 
and started shopping it around at, at different publishers. I found one publisher that uh, uh, would publish it. Initially, it was called The Ingenuous Soldier. Uh, the one publisher in Georgia said he would publish it if I were to rewrite it in the third person. And he said, here's a hint for you, too. He says, you may want to consider the title Cherries. Uh, Ingenuous soldier is, is kind of uh, the same definition. It's a naive uh, uh, person, yeah. uh, a cherry, and cherry being a slang for uh, a virgin. Uh, I wasn't a hero over there. It was just an ordinary uh, infantry soldier trying to do his job, trained to do his job. And uh, eventually, after all of the... Uh, rewriting, I got halfway through the rewrite. The new version of the book was already larger than the initial book, and I put it away. I put it up in the attic of the garage, and it sat there for the next 20 years. Wow. When uh, I went to my 25th uh, high school, or I'm sorry, my 40th high school reunion, uh, during the 25th, I had taken the manuscript there and let my classmates who, when I graduated in a Catholic school, there was only 60 kids in a high school. Uh, so they circulated it, you know, and, and here 10 years later, I had forgotten all about it. So at the 40th reunion, the questions are, hey, what'd you do with the book? What'd you do with the book? And it's, what are you talking about? What book? And they had told me how they all read it. They loved it. Uh, oh, you can't put it away. You've got to finish it, and we'll help you, and we'll do this and that. And they all pitched in. It, it was remarkable That's how uh, uh, one of my classmates knew somebody in a computer place, and it was, well, let's take these Atari discs, which I had about 100 of them, uh, and get them converted over to Microsoft Word, but that was like $1,300 to do that. That was no way I had that kind of money. So my daughter volunteered to retype it if I was able to print that out. Well, up in the attic, I still had the, the program. I still had fan fold paper. I had a dot matrix printer. I had green, red, black, and yellow ink, but those cartridges were all dried up. So uh, I played with alcohol and peroxide, and uh, it took an entire weekend, but I was able to print out the, the half a story. My daughter retyped it all, both versions actually, and gave them to me on a stick. And I sat back after work on weekends, and I finished that book six months later and had it published in April of 2010. But again, it initially started out just to satisfy my wife's curiosity and, and to paint a picture for her so, so she would understand. That's, That's why story, I wrote the book. That's a great story. You had some nice help there, didn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah you did. Well, you know, I think some of the, some of the things you mentioned before you must have been driven to tell your story because evidently when you came home, other than your wife and maybe your mom, your colleagues didn't want to hear about it. Well, I wasn't married. I didn't meet my wife until a year after I got out of service. Okay. So she didn't, she didn't know me then. I did have a fiancé when I went over there, but I got a dear John while I was there. Uh, and after oh, being yeah. married 42 years, I think that was the right move. It sounds like it, yeah. But uh, to answer your question, yeah, it kids that uh, that were my neighbors or friends that I used to hang out with, uh, I came back after the war and and they didn't want to even deal with me anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, we were baby killers, and the press had had given us bad images. So everybody thought that we would go off on a nut and start shooting everybody yeah. if, if somebody angered us. Uh, my family was very supportive. Uh, they loved me being back. Uh, my wife 
uh, once I met her and she found out I was a Vietnam vet, she got real excited, uh, very supportive. And uh, we moved on from there. Actually, I had a job at, at the automotive place I mentioned earlier. And because I was uh, going into the service, they had to guarantee that job when I came back. Sure. So when I came back, the people that I knew there didn't want to know me anymore. Uh, so I was kind of like the lonesome stranger. And uh, I met new friends or made new friends there and, and uh, life went on. Sure. You know, John, that's kind of a, a story that has been told throughout this nation for years. And I want to, again, compliment you on what your book is doing and continues to do. It's allowing people to ask questions that they're embarrassed to ask. Those people you talked about that you knew before you left and shunned you when you come back are going to read your book. They're going to finally understand what Vietnam did to this country and for this country. And maybe after reading Cherries and books like it, the Vietnam vet will get the respect they deserve. And a lot of that's due to you and your work. And we certainly appreciate it. All the vets, thank you for publishing this book. It is tremendous. Well, thank you. One of the other, uh, as I was finishing it up and going through an editing process, uh, a gal I went to school with actually edited the, uh, the book for me. Her name is Barb. And uh, not knowing anything about Vietnam, she, uh, she did an excellent job by questioning me sure. and making me spell things out a little bit more clearer uh, and so on. I've heard, uh, as you know, I have the blog and, and I'm on Facebook, but I have heard from wives and children of Vietnam vets that have read the book and now we're able to engage their father and spouse in conversation and allow them to open up because now they could maybe relate to some of the stuff that he could not say. Sure. Uh, I've had other vets thank me for writing their story. <laughs> and I've also heard from uh, the guys, I want to call them the kids in, uh, in <laughs> Iraq and Afghanistan. Sure, the, the youngsters. And they said that, hey, if you eliminate the spiders and uh, and the snakes and substitute scorpions and fleas, that's my story. Yeah. That's that's what I'm doing here. So then I started to promote it in such a way so that perhaps the family members of those soldiers fighting in Iraq and, and Afghanistan could then better understand what they're going through and maybe... Uh, be an easier reunion when they came home afterwards. Sure. Because what you said earlier is very true, is a lot of the Vietnam veterans came home to a, a blank stare in an empty room, and people that loved them didn't know how to talk to them, didn't know how to ask questions, didn't want to make a fool of themselves or embarrass their loved one, so they dummied up. Everybody went underground for a while. Ten years. We started in North Carolina to put this course together called Lessons of Vietnam 20 years ago. And getting it into the high schools was like robbing a bank. But once we got it in, like you just said, things started to come about like phone calls. People saying, well, thank you. I cannot talk to my dad. Thank you. I cannot talk to this. I can do this. And it just went on and on and on. And your book spells that out exactly. John, we're talking about the book. Give us a quick synopsis of just what you're tell, saying in the book, your, your story. Uh, you were a grunt. Uh, when was. you left Dining for Replacement, uh, where you went, and uh, a little bit about uh, what you did, where you were, uh, and so forth. Just give us a little bit of give a little, the story of the book, if you would. All right. Uh, I arrived there in August of 70, went to the 90th Replacement. And uh, within the next day, I was assigned to the 25th Infantry Division uh, in a unit called the Wolfhounds. There was the 1st and the 2nd Division. Uh, in fact, and this might be the same for, for other units throughout the country, 
but they were so notorious in that part of the country that the enemy had wanted posters for any wolfhound member, dead or alive, and they would get a ton of money for it. Uh, but we went into areas uh, northwest of Saigon, and I spent eight months there as, uh, again, an infantry soldier, carried a machine gun for a while, uh, walked point for about three months, and eventually ended up with uh, carrying a radio for the lieutenant in the first platoon. And in a way, that was kind of cool because uh, as an infantry grunt, so to speak, you have no idea where you're going, mm -hmm. how long it's going to take to get there, what's going on anywhere else. Uh, you just follow the head in front of you and you react if, if something happens. Uh, once I got into carrying a radio, then I was privy to everything going on within the company because other platoons would be uh, calling in. Uh, I'd know who was wounded, who was killed. Uh, it, it just made it a little bit more interesting. Uh, and there were always, at that point in time, uh, rumors that uh, the peace agreements were coming uh, to a close, our sure. units were going to go home, everybody was going to come home and such. And it was around January that uh, those rumors were so strong, uh, everybody thought they were going home. We were celebrating everything else. And it came to the point that, well, if you've got eight months or more in country, you're going to return with the unit to Hawaii. If you don't, you're going to be reassigned. Well, I only had six months in country by that time, so I was going somewhere else and I was crushed. Uh, working in that area, uh, west of Saigon, was near the Cambodian border. That's where the Ho Chi Minh Trail was coming in and most of the infiltration sure. coming into Saigon from that area. Uh, there were some uh, notorious places called the Hobo Woods. Uh, the Iron Triangle. Uh, these were places that were doused with Agent Orange. And we walked through there not knowing, well, knowing that it was a defoliant, but not knowing what we know about it today. And we sat in this stuff. We slept in this stuff. We drank the water from the streams uh, that were polluted with that. And uh, everything had a dead, rotten smell to it. You know, uh, it, it, it's hard to, well, maybe if you went to a fruit market and all the spoiled fruit was sitting there uh, two or three days after the fact, well, that's kind of like how everything yeah, smelled. Yeah. You know, it's uh, to, make, to make you relate to that. Well, because I had to go somewhere else, uh, they sent me up to the 101st, which operated north of Da Nang. So I was very close to the uh, DMZ at that point. Uh, everything there was mountains. And I was used to uh, carrying 60 pounds on my back. And even with the machine gun or the radio on top of that, that was another 25 pounds in addition. But walking on the flat when I, I'd say, uh, when compared to what happened up north, man, it was a cakewalk. But working out of the mountains, it would take all day to climb a mountain. Sometimes you never made it to the top. And we had to spend the night on the side of the mountains, tying ourselves to trees so that we wouldn't roll down the hill. Uh, we had to dig foxholes up north, which we didn't do down south. We had to wear flak jackets, which we didn't do down south. And we had steel helmets that we had to wear that we didn't do down south. Now, I had already had six months experience by the time I went up there, but it was a whole together a different war. Uh, we had predominantly North Vietnamese Army soldiers there. Uh, they, were, they were soldiers trained just like we were, and they were relentless. Yeah. Uh, it was a difficult time. And uh, 
doing things in both places that I never thought would be humanly possible. Uh, but yet we succeeded and we made our way through there. Uh, about that time, the Marines were pulling out and this was around May, June time frame, and my particular company started taking over uh, some of the facilities while the Marines were going home and uh, providing security until we could turn it over to the Arvin soldier, which was a South Vietnamese uh, regular soldier. And then we would move on to a different place and these camps would start uh, shutting down and we would provide security at the base of these hills while uh, the bunkers were destroyed and equipment moved out and then we would move on elsewhere. Sure. But you had mentioned earlier about 1968 and Tet, uh, 67 and 68 were, were the most dangerous years of the war uh, when the most soldiers died. 69 was was also that way, but it was on the backside of the hill coming down. And in 70, it seemed like uh, the enemy soldiers were trying to avoid us so that uh, we would go home sooner. Uh, in some instances, the, the only way uh, a fight developed is that we tripped over them as we were uh, walking through the thick jungle where you, you can't see five feet in front of you and boom, you step right onto a bunker. Uh, so altogether, it was a whole different experience up north. Uh, I, I said earlier in the book that uh, coming home after that, we got fitted for new uniforms, and I went over there with a 36-inch waist and weighing 180 pounds. I had a 29-inch waist when I came home and weighed 140 pounds. Wow. Uh, it didn't take me long to, to outgrow those uniforms, so I think I had six months left in the service after that. I would not uh, extend, because I didn't want no more of that, and <laughs> ended up going to Fort Hood, Texas, and Jeez. stayed there for four months and got an early release discharged from the Army just before Christmas in 1971, which was about two and a half months early. Good. And that's my military uh, Vietnam history. Yeah, John, I, um, I, I also got stationed at Fort Hood when I came back. It's, uh, yeah, uh, you're definitely telling my story. Uh, at the time you were th there and were, uh, the rumors that the peace talks were going on, what was the attitude of the American soldier? That, uh, we, re we see, and there's so many myths about Vietnam, we see where guys were refusing to go out on patrol because nobody wanted to be the last uh, last guy killed in Vietnam. What was the real story of the attitude there? You were, I believe, a sergeant by then, and uh, so you had a little bit of um, uh, rank that uh, you were more in charge of some of the guys. Did you have problems with, uh, with guys doing what you wanted them to do because everybody was short kind of? Attitude. Well, I didn't. I didn't become a sergeant until I got up north with the 101st. Mm -hmm. uh, so I wasn't in a leadership role until you know we left on the 25th. I was a radio operator. Yeah. But uh, yeah, people people were worried. It, it was just like uh, those last few days out in the jungle before the unit was going home. Uh, we didn't want to do anything. I mean, it, I've heard some units have uh, called in fake locations and stayed put for two or three days. Actually, mm -hmm. my, my unit did that once. And unfortunately, we stepped into a booby trap when we left because mm -hmm. they were aware of us being there. Uh, Nobody, nobody outright refused to do anything. I mean, we were out there. We had a job to do. Uh, it was to survive and protect your buddy. Sure. So nobody wanted to go ahead and let go of that. Uh, and we didn't really refuse any orders to do anything. Uh, I know we postponed. We argued with upper uh, <laughs> management, uh, <laughs> with the upper officers. We had just gotten into a fire base. Uh, we were prepared for two or three nights there 
before going back out and they wanted us to immediately turn around and hump back out about uh, 4,000 meters uh, with only an hour of daylight left. And we put up an argument, no, we're not walking in the dark, especially when you don't know where you're going. So they allowed us to stay overnight and we left first thing in the morning and still uh, missed out on two days of our stand down. John, I had, I had a question I want you to comment on that comes up a lot in the classroom as we teach Vietnam and it deals with race relations. When, when your tour of duty in Vietnam, how did you uh, come across the black-white problem in Nam, or was there one where you were? Oh, there was one. Uh, <clears throat> because I was I was raised in Detroit, and on the uh, on the Lower East Side, uh, our neighborhoods were racially mixed, and most of my friends were uh, African American, and at that time. Back in 68, 69, uh, the Black Power movement was taking place, uh, the Brotherhood, there were handshakes, which they referred to as a DAP, which were, were real complex. Uh, I think I made a joke in the book that uh, uh, there were four or five guys introducing themselves for the first time and they went through this, which took about five minutes and I had made a crack that I bet they still don't know each other's name. No, I read that. John, <laughs> we have somebody on the line. We're going to take a question, okay? Sure. Hello? Hey, guys. It's Paul White. Hey, Paul. How's it going? Great. Uh, what's your question? Well, I uh, tuned in kind of late here, but you had the question about... Uh, uh, troop refusals and so forth, and uh, uh, actually, uh, I have uh, had some exposure to that. Uh, uh, I was on a fire base, fire base pace uh, on the Cambodian border, um, and it was under siege from uh, September 25th through uh, October the 22nd of 1971, uh, and the uh, uh, Bravo Company um, of First Cab Division uh, came out on the ninth, and they were ordered to do a night ambush, uh, and they refused to go. Uh, four days later, um, Delta Company uh, showed up, and they were uh, told to do patrols around the fire base, and they were uh, initially uh, refused to do that. And uh, finally, they did uh, go out, and uh, this. The background was that the engineers who had built the fire base had set up automatic ambushes uh, in the tree line around the fire base, and, and they had left, and nobody knew where they were. But they knew they were out there. So the uh, guys in Bravo Company uh, thought it was pretty foolish to go out there at night and uh, uh, run up against uh, these automatic ambushes, and so uh, I think they uh, were flown out the next day. Uh, and then uh, when Delta Company finally went on um, uh, their patrol, uh, they gathered up a bunch of uh, Claymore uh, mines that uh, uh, the uh, story is that they came back to the uh, battalion commander, well, the, uh, um, the base commander, uh, who had ordered the f patrol and just dumped them at his feet uh, as a statement of this is uh, why, you know, uh, we initially refused to go out and um, uh, you know it was that uh, time of uh, I think uh, some of the lowest morale um, and uh, uh, nobody wanted to be the last one to die in a war that uh, it was already determined we were not going to win at least in the uh, sense that we have won uh, some of the other previous wars and so uh, those instances uh, did exist um, as far as the uh, upper uh, cadre was concerned, eventually they uh, just kind of wrote it off. Uh, it, some of the reporters said it was a mutiny, uh, which it wasn't. Uh, I think these soldiers were just using good common sense, uh, knowing something about uh, what they were being asked to walk into, and uh, ultimately they were proven right. Uh, and so uh, those were the two incidents that... Uh, that I was 
um, around for Delta Company, but not for Bravo Company just four days before that. Well, so. Paul, you are you are an RTO, but and you were there what seventy one. 71, 72, that's yeah. right. Okay, so basically what John was saying, from what John was saying, it, it escalated and got worse as it uh, got closer and closer to the time we pulled out. Um, well, October was uh, a pretty uh, pretty bad month for us. Uh, we got uh, uh, incoming uh, day and night while we were at the fire base. Um, problem was uh, when, it, uh, when it was coming in, you didn't know – where to go, uh, I guess you, uh, you know, you always head for the closest shelter you can find, but uh, you never knew whether you were running into trouble or away from it, uh, okay. you know, with the artillery and so forth that they were uh, lobbing at us uh, during that period of time. All right. Well, appreciate you adding that to, uh, too, Paul. That was, uh, it kind of gives the complex, uh, kind of tells the story of how things uh uh, morale and and the situation got worse as it got closer and closer. Uh, I would imagine by by the end of '72 it was really getting uh, uh, tough. Um, John, uh, as you were talking about, uh, as you were an RTO. That's a great story. A, a gentleman was just called in. He was an RTO uh, also, and uh, that antenna is a is a good target for for guys to to uh, shoot at and. Uh, yeah, I guess you try to keep that antenna kind of bent over most of the time. Yeah, it's a flexible antenna. Mm -hmm. And uh, most of the time during the patrols, we would keep it bent over our shoulder and bring it down and tuck it into our, into our web belt as long as uh, the other units were nearby. If they couldn't hear us, then we had to extend it all the way. But sure. uh, most... Most of the places that it really put our RTO in jeopardy were when we got out into the uh, into the high grass. Uh, then it was uh, like a, a periscope on a on a submarine coming through the water from a distance. You can see the antenna overhead and and just come forward a little bit and down, and the sniper would go ahead and have a nice headshot. Hey, John, you know you you were talking earlier before that. The book has kind of catapulted you into be a, an expert on Vietnam and a speaker in some of the high schools and some of the places like this. Can you um, recall perhaps the hardest question, the most difficult question was asked to you from a high school student? Well, the most common question was, did you kill anybody? Yes. And, and that was something that uh, I honestly don't know because I never saw an enemy soldier face to face to, to be able to, well, I take that back, there was one instance, but most of the engagements we had were just muzzle flashes. You didn't know who was shooting at you, how many, male, female, or what, and your intent was just to shoot them up. Now, when you eventually found a body, which a lot of time was disheartening because they would carry their bodies away. Sure and you thought you had a successful engagement, you might have thought that you overwhelmed everybody, and then when you go out, you, you only find blood traces, but you find no bodies. Uh, but what's important is there's more than one hole in these bodies. And so, did you, didn't you? I contributed to it, but personally, I can't say that I knowingly did kill somebody. Uh, John, that's a question we all get. Uh, we I seem to get it more from their junior high school students than we hear it do anybody else. But it's hard for them to understand that you can spend an entire year in a war shooting at people and getting shot at and never see the enemy. Uh, I, I think it would be nice if it, sometimes we could show people just elephant grass and how thick it is and, and how it grows. Uh, you could sh get shot or shoot at somebody and you couldn't see them within hand, almost within uh, arm's reach of them and still not see them. And it's hard for people, I think, to understand that you go through a war fighting and getting shot at, as I said, and, get, and shooting back and never really see a live enemy. Uh, you might can see where they move, the bend, or, or at, at the body and so forth. It's, uh, it's, hard to, it's, hard, it's really hard to relate to, uh, for people to relate to that situation. It's not like World War II and so forth, and a uh, totally different situation. John, you... That's absolutely correct, but it's the same same thing in the villages. 
Yeah. Yeah. Because if you had anybody that was of military age, somebody between, say, 16 and 35, uh, most of the villages or all the villages, you didn't see any people in that age bracket uh, because they were often in jungles wearing their conical hats, shooting at the soldiers when they came by. Uh, majority of the shooting would have been uh, barrages of, of either artillery or mortars or snipers taking pot shots. Uh, but it's no different in Iraq and Afghanistan. Who's the enemy over there? You know, they're, they're not wearing a uniform. They're not, uh, uh, they're not identified as such. So you're, you're walking blind and, and with the new rules of engagement, uh, which we also had in Vietnam, sometimes you couldn't shoot back unless you were shot at. Correct. Uh, w which made fighting the war difficult as well. John, in your book, you went into great detail, and I will confess to you, I read this chapter about ten times. Your rat story. <laughs> when you talked oh. about when you talked about the rats, <laughs> you had me, honest to God, John, you had me back forty years ago, at four thirty this morning. I was back in Pleiku. I didn't want to go back there, but I went back because of your writing. Can you go through for the audience again a little bit about your rat story? Well, in the most bunkers in, in uh, around the perimeters on any base in Vietnam uh, had rats, and they would come out, you know, at night and visit people. <laughs> when uh, we took over an empty uh, fire base that had been vacant for about two months. Uh, we went up, and you could see the the uh, the dumps uh, were smoldering, and and so much the the bunkers were in disrepair, uh, and there were little small tunnels, you know, like the gophers would make. You'd see some of them uh, in the dirt on a floor of the bunker, sometimes even in between sandbags, and in this one particular case, uh, a uh, there were four or five guys in a bunker, and all of a sudden, one of these rats, which was probably as big as a tomcat, fell off of one of the overhead beams onto this guy's chest. And still, that wasn't enough to wake him up. So he came over to his lips, and he started sniffing his mouth uh, for the scent of food, and he started licking him. Uh, well, this guy woke up, and... and uh, he was laying under his poncho liner, and he was able to go ahead and flick uh, this rat off, and it just scared everybody to death. Uh, so to try and rectify the, the conditions, because people were getting bit, and they'd have to be dusted off to the hospital for rabies shots. Oh, yeah. uh, so we, our CO, developed a contest and promised... Uh, uh, for the time that we were on that fire base, which, which was estimated at a couple of weeks, that the person with the largest rat discovered uh, during that time would get a, a two-day R&R pass to China Beach. Uh, About and it. every day they would lay these rats out. Uh, we, we promoted safety. I mean, you could, you could use a shovel, you could use whatever you had in your hands, but we sort of uh, went against using firearms because uh, you could hurt somebody legally that way. And yeah. we had hundreds of rats that we uncovered and held out. And every morning we would have a measuring and uh, a winner declared for that particular day. Uh, but, you know, soldiers, they, they find ways through different things, you know. And, and on that first day, you, you'd get some that would add some tail from another one to this one or <laughs> go ahead, or add some body from another one so yeah, that he'd tissue. have overall the longest rat. But, uh, man, these things, if, if you were online and one of these things come traipsing over you, there was no light to turn on. There was no flashlight to turn on. 
I mean, you know these suckers were running and laying in there with you. You just hoped and prayed that you didn't get bit during the night because there was absolutely nothing that you can do for about it. Oh, boy. Yeah. That's quite a story, the rat story. Yeah. Uh, John, I want to make sure that uh, I get this in a little bit. Uh, tell us how you got into the blogging business and uh, how people can uh, go in and, and, and read your blogs. Well, it eventually started as, as a web page for my book when it was published. And I was looking for feedback from people that have read it uh, and ask questions so that I could answer them. And because of the input on Facebook and the different groups that I had belonged to, there were questions posed. And what I decided to do was modify the blog and I would either write personal argument or uh, articles or else I would find something and contact the writer and have him uh, be a guest blogger, yeah. getting getting the, the credit. But I turned it into uh, an educational site. I mm -hmm. wanted to dig deeper into what actually happened in Vietnam to a typical soldier. Uh, the R and R experience, the uh, coming home experience, the uh, just a number of different things. I've I've compiled over 150 different articles, uh, a bunch of pictures. I have video, and I also have uh, a picture. Uh, how you want to call it? my actual pictures for my tour in Vietnam set to music. And uh, there's about a hundred of them and yep. it goes through and it sort of gives people an opportunity Very to nice. visualize what they might have read in a book as to what it was actually like over there and see what I was talking about. Yeah, I've, uh, I've, I receive your blogs and I thoroughly enjoy uh, reading them just like your book. And, uh, I, I just want to make sure that people who would have the opportunity to uh, also read your blogs and how to how to get to it and how to uh, purchase your book. Let's let's get a little commercial here and uh, uh, how can they get your book and how can they get in uh, touch with you about your blog? What do they got to do? Well, to get to the blog, it's uh, Cherry's Writer C H E R R I E S W R I T E R dot wordpress.com and that will take you to my home page there is information there on how to and where to uh, find the book uh, electronically I've allowed for every version of e-reader uh, the Apple the uh, Barnes & Noble the Amazon reader whatever uh, format you need it's available I do have an audio book available that is word for word. Uh, there's a fellow that, that uh, well, that's a different story. Uh, <laughs> there, so the information on where to purchase the book, either electronically, an audio book, or a paper version are available within the blog. Uh, once you open up an article, there's there's roughly 17, 18 pages with about 10 different articles on each page. You click whichever one you want, you open them up, and I've made sure to attach pictures to uh, every article that I write so that it's much more informational uh, without somebody having to guess what I'm trying to say. And uh, that's basically it. Uh, there, there is a, a link there that you can join to uh, uh, to be identified via email whenever a new article is published. Uh, you can go there, click, leave your email address, and every time I launch a new uh, article, you'll be notified by email to uh, that a new article is available and, and come on and see it. Yeah, yeah I've. Uh... Uh, I get I get them on my uh, sent to me by email uh, on a regular basis. Like I said, I really I really enjoy them. You're doing a great service because, as I mentioned when we got started here, there's so many myths and mis facts about the Vietnam vets, and it's like like we said a while ago. You basically 
uh, I was an engineer and I was not out uh, humping it constantly, but I was out. And uh, everything from the rats to knife replacement to uh, Agent Orange and drinking the water, uh, it's, it's my story, and I, I think it's most Vietnam vets' story, uh, depending on, on the time and, and jobs and so forth. So it's a valuable asset that you have there with a the blog. Uh, we're finding more and more people now are, are interested in Vietnam because of the 50th commemoration coming on and so forth. Uh, it's like uh, right now there's, uh, if you uh, look at the um, last census, there's probably, I think there's somewhere around a little less than 3 million of Vietnam vets, but there was 13 million uh, people in the census that said they were Vietnam vets. And, uh, yeah, everybody wants to get on the bandwagon now yeah. because it's popular. Yeah, if they right. could have gone in my place, I would have been. I would have been happy to stay at home. Well, John, yes, indeed. John, you went into um, very nice detail in your book also about um, burning a certain substance in Vietnam, and uh, Mr. Dixon and Mr. Matthews are also burners. I was a cream of the crap when I was over there. I, I got a lot of opportunity. Uh, I, I wrote about my experience. Yes, you it, did. It was, it was the first and only uh, experience. But uh, <laughs> to relieve bodily functions, uh, <laughs> there were a couple places. Uh, for urine, there was a uh, an artillery shell, uh, shell casing that was uh, in, in the ground, and it was covered with netting. And you were expected to stand out there in the open and, you know, let her rip. Yeah. Uh, as far as uh, having to go the other way, they normally had a, a setup that uh, would have three holes in a plank, three half a barrels under each one, a little step. Uh, and then you would just sit on the hole and take care of business. And again, sure. this was out in the open. You could talk to the two guys next to you, pass each other toilet paper, which sometimes you ran out of. And it was lucky you read in the newspaper because then you can use it. Well, there is no plumbing there, so you have to get rid of the waste. And what we have to do is, is open up the trap door underneath and pull out that half a barrel. So there'd be three of them. You'd have to pull each one out uh, pull it about maybe 20, 30 feet away and put the empty ones in there and pour some diesel fuel in the three, throw a match in there and stand back and watch it burn. The thing is, you have to continue to stir it like porridge. <laughs> and it, it's an all-day job. You are and painting sometimes, a vivid picture, John. Thank you. Yes. Well, John, you got to realize that when you were during, when you were burning crap, nobody gave you any crap. That's a fact. Uh, when you were burning crap, nobody shot at you, probably. That's a fact. Uh, the mosquitoes were left you alone, and you never got a leech on you when you were burning crap. That is true. So it wasn't all that bad now looking back at it. No, but I'd never do it again. <laughs> well, I got more than one opportunity. I got, I got several opportunities to do it during my time over and there. I did, too. Then you should have a medal for that. I, I I have the pin on my hat. Yes, we both do. <laughs> I have the pin on my hat. Well, listen, we really appreciate you being on, and I, I hope people will uh, take this and and go into um, uh, your blog and, and 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 receive it each each uh, each time you do it uh, because it is some fantastic uh, information. And it's also enjoyable, a uh, good laugh, like we were just talking about with the. Uh, uh, sanitary uh, engineer, uh, as well as the rats, because I think all Vietnam vets, one way to have a, to have their own rat story. Uh, the size of the rats over there are were just unbelievable. Uh, did you, uh, when y'all were there, did you uh, eat uh, sea rations or did you eat off the economy any? Uh, what did you do for food? Sea rations, that's all we ate. You, you yeah. were probably a real uh, fond, uh, fond of ham and lima then. No, I love the eggs and ham, though. You did? <laughs> yeah, you can eat them things cold. You can eat them any time of the day, and, and they were nice texture. Yes, they were. Uh, compared to the lima beans and ham and green eggs and ham and all yeah. that other stuff they, they had. Spaghetti was pretty good, too. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I like the turkey. Well, John, like you, the turkey. you know, John, the uh, afterglow of cherries and what you're doing and have done. 
I think your greatest service is to the Vietnam veteran who for years felt voiceless in a canyon. And you were telling their story. They read their story. They retell their story. Someone read your book over and over and over, layer after layer, classroom after classroom. The men on the wall in D.C., the 58,000 men and women, their story is finally being told to everybody, thanks to men like you. And I cannot give you enough gratitude as an ex-teacher and someone that has taught Vietnam all over the country. Your service is invaluable, and I hope you don't mind if we trumpet your book wherever we go, tell people about your blog. We're going to speak in November in New Orleans at the National Social Studies Teachers Convention. We're putting on a program on teaching Vietnam in America, and we'd like to offer your book there and get everybody your information. Well, just briefly, I know that uh, we talked about it earlier. Uh, several schools, uh, history classes, had the teachers had required their students to read my book. Very nice. And go ahead and make out reports uh, at the end. Some were very elaborate. Sure. Uh, and others, it, it was sort of eye-opening for them. And one teacher in, uh, in Colorado, right near the Air Force Base there, most of her students are military kids from the base, sure. but uh, they're interested in doing a Skype uh, sort of face-to-face -face with them uh, after the next class reads their book in a fall. That's amazing. Yeah, that's great. That's great. We just did a panel uh, with a high school. Uh, the English department required all their students to read the things they carried, and we just went back in, and, and after they read it and did a panel discussion discussing that book. But uh, I can see your book being right there, right there with them. It, it tells the real story yeah, uh, where the things they carried it really didn't do that. It's uh, things they carried from, for us Southern rednecks. It's kind of it's pretty deep. But uh, uh, like I said, your, your book is just like sitting down and talking, talking to you, and uh, except you stole all my story. <laughs> and uh, John, I'm not sure if uh, I read your entire background, but. Have you contemplated, or have you been back to Vietnam? No. Have you contemplated nope. it? Didn't think about it. Uh, probably would not go back. Okay. We uh, we went uh, we went back in two thousand nine. We actually spent the night with two former VCs at their house, and that was an experience. So uh, to talk to uh, uh, he was a captain, and. Uh, we sit around in his uh, uh, gazebo at about four o'clock in the morning, drinking his moonshine, uh, <laughs> talking about his war stories. And first thing he showed us was he never he was in pajamas all the time, not black pajamas, regular sleeping pajamas. And the first thing he showed us, he held pulled up his shirt and showed us where the helicopter had shot him. And we actually had one of the guys with us was a helicopter pilot, uh, Civil Star David Samuels. And he had his crew with him. So we always wondered if that was Davis was one of the guys that shot him. But uh, uh, it's, it's a totally different place now. Uh, it is communist, but it is a totally different place, a beautiful place. And the people really love Americans. And, uh, I've heard, too, that you had followers oh, yes. uh, keeping, keeping an eye on you, making sure that you didn't... Uh, go into places you shouldn't Everywhere be. Everywhere you go. Not, well, not so much now. I'd say when we back in 2009, that was the way it was. Uh, it's pretty it's pretty much loose. You can go, of course, when you get there, you put your uh, uh, passport in the hotel and they keep it. But you can go pretty much anywhere you want to. Everywhere we've asked to go, we've been allowed to go. And like I said, with Song, uh, uh, he knows almost every battle, a major battle in Vietnam can give you the background and so forth. Yeah, he does. Uh, we went to uh, well, we went to Hanoi and went to what we call the Chinese water torture show, which was the uh, where the puppets in the water and so forth. But us uh, full size American uh, GIs like me, I gained two people since I came home. Cool. Sitting in that Vietnamese theater, sitting in those Vietnamese seats was 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 pretty much torture. Uh, had like going to, to a hockey game. Yeah, <laughs> kind of like that, yeah. But um, uh, it has definitely changed. So if you get a chance to uh, think about it sometime, you ought to think about it. If you're down in North Carolina way, 
come down to God's country. Uh, listen, this is a, a great place for uh, uh, for Yankees to come live. I married one. Uh, we we have two uh, Yankees here. We have damn Yankees and Yankees. Damn Yankees come down and stay. Uh, we'd love for you to come down and become a damn Yankee sometime. Uh, well, I'm glad I didn't pick up the accent. Normally I do. <laughs> we don't have accents. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, thank you, Pollock. Hey, I do appreciate uh, your invitation, and uh, and thank you for the hype. Yeah. Certainly, yeah. certainly. We uh, appreciate your book, appreciate you coming on, and appreciate all the things you're doing for the kids of the country as well as, as Bob said, for the Vietnam vets. And I hope you have a, a good remainder of your night. I do appreciate it. Thank you, John. Thank you, John. Hey, Paul, anything else you wanted to say? Oh, um, no, I guess not. Um, okay. go, go ahead. We're on, we're on, we're on bar time. Uh, what's your question? Uh, uh, well, I was um, going to chime in earlier when you asked about the toughest question that, that uh, came up in the classroom, and uh, uh, I lost my audio for about three minutes, so I kind of let that go, but... Uh, uh, anyway, I handle that uh, kind of uh, up front now, and I tell them uh, when I go into the classroom that uh, killing my business and business was good, and uh, I let that set on them for a few moments, and then I tell them about uh, the uh, multitude of mosquitoes that I killed and the centipedes and the scorpions and the leeches and uh, uh, rattle off a, a few other uh, nature's creatures that... Uh, 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 that I killed while I was over there, and it uh, gets them going for a, a little bit, and then, you know, they get the lighthearted uh, uh, part that I'm trying to get across to them. So. Yeah, John, we've gone into schools where, uh, we talked about a while ago, the Mona Bees. We've gone into uh -huh. schools where they talk about, well, how many did you kill and skin when you were there? And mm -hmm. because some Mona Bee has gone in and talked about killing, uh, killing the Vietnamese and skinning them and, and all this sort of stuff, and uh, the kids, of course, don't know the difference, and uh, uh, it seems the, the 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 biggest wannabes have the biggest uh, gorious stories. Oh, of course. Well, that's I will why say, a lot of the adults think the same thing. Yeah. yeah. I so. will say that uh, the question that uh, I really had to face, um, and and this was when I was linking uh, with a student uh, before I started speaking. Uh, was what was my greatest challenge in Vietnam. And uh, I really hadn't thought about that until he asked. And my greatest challenge was my attitude. Um, uh, my attitude just really sucked uh, while I was there. And uh, if I could go back and redo the whole thing, uh, I would do it with a much better attitude and try to be, um, um, you know, a bright spot in the area instead of, uh, uh, you know, a downer. But, uh, you know, I was just like everybody else that I was around uh, at that time. Uh, I think uh, morale was at its, uh, close to its lowest point. Um, and uh, it's kind of hard to be uh, positive and upbeat. But uh, anyway, that's the thing I would like to go back and change if I had an opportunity. Well, Paul, you need to get uh, John's book to hear his and read it. it uh, I think you'll see yourself in there quite a bit. Uh, well, it sounds like it, and I certainly appreciate you sharing with us tonight, John. It was uh, very interesting. I'm sorry I missed the first part of it, but uh, I will definitely get your book and read that. Well, you, you, you know you can go back in uh, a couple of days and uh, see it on demand and, 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 miss, and see that part you missed. Okay, that's a good idea. In fact, we'll about an hour you can do that. You can go back in. If you can't sleep tonight, go back in. You'll be able to see the show again. <laughs> John, you can do the same. Uh, if anybody that you uh, talk to would like to see the show, uh, they can go back to the ncvi.org uh, website and go to TV show and go into archives and see the show we just did. So well, what I might do is is even uh, copy and paste it onto my blog, and then this way there'll be a notification that goes out and people will be able to watch it, even if it's only a link. There you go. And they could link back to uh, to your website yeah. and and be able to uh, watch it again. Okay, that'd be great because I, I think what you've said and your book is such a valuable asset that I think we ought to make sure that as many people uh, get a chance, uh, Vietnam vets as well as students. So uh, I'm getting this cut 
message okay. from uh, producer, director. Stay well. Uh, thank you, sir, and uh, appreciate you, and welcome home. Thank you, John. Great, great show. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, guys. tuned to the Nissan Communications Network. Our weekly lineup of call-in programs includes Computers 2K Now with Amnon Nissan, Health In with Debbie Brooke, Breaking Free with Marilyn Shannon, Lessons of Vietnam with NCBBI members, The Tanya Love Show, Your Healthy Pet with Gisela DiCarlo. And if you tuned in too late, you can always watch each program in its entirety or download an MP3 audio file of it at www.nissancommunications.com. Sponsored by Atomus.com, makers of quality video recorders and converters for professionals. CarolinaApparel.com and DeltaForce.net.